Welcome to the step-by-step 12-lead -step ECG workshop. I'm Dr Richard Hatchett, a London UK-based nurse tutor and co-editor of the books Cardiac Nursing, A Comprehensive Guide and Nurse-Led Clinics, Practice Issues and I've been teaching 12-lead ECG interpretation for over 20 years. Now I've put this workshop together for those of you with a basic knowledge or an almost absent knowledge of 12 lead ECG interpretation. It may have been something you've been wanting to do for a while, but you just haven't had the time. This is the workshop for you. There are three sessions and in them, I'll go through the basics of 12 lead ECG interpretation, ending up with a whole series of examples that I'll talk you through in a systematic way. The systematic interpretation is very important. And when you finish the workshop, and remember you can replay each session as many times as you want until you've got the principles, I'll give you a self-test. You can look at the examples and work through the principles I've taught you and then look at the answers. So if you're ready, I'll go through what each of the sessions entails. In session one, I'll take you through the basics of the conduction system and relate this to sinus rhythm. That's the normal rhythm we want to see. I'll relate sinus rhythm to the ECG complex and then relate that complex to the whole 12-lead ECG. And I'll explain why, if the patient is in sinus rhythm, that all of the leads look different. And in addition, I'll give you a very useful tip to help you identify quickly when you're in practice which areas of the heart the different limb leads are looking at. I think you'll find that very useful. I'll also go through calibration on the 12-lead and how you calculate the heart rate and other important measurements such as the PR interval and the width of the QRS complex. In session two, I'll take you through a systematic review of the 12-lead ECG, a short but very important session. In session three, we'll look at examples together in the systematic approach. And once you've finished, the quiz is yours to self-test against. Okay, so if you're ready, Let's start with session one. Now, as we begin session one, let's take a look at a diagrammatic representation of the conduction system in the heart that's relevant to interpreting the 12 lead ECG. But before we do that, I need to introduce two terms to you, depolarization and repolarization. Now, these two terms belie some quite complex physiological processes and I advise you to look at any good anatomy and physiology book to understand them. But basically you need to understand that the heart has the intrinsic ability to create an electrical impulse within it, devoid of a nervous impulse. As long as it's got a blood supply, the heart can generate an electrical impulse. It has what we know uh, to be an autorhythmic quality. Of course there are nervous impulses going to the heart, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems increase or decrease heart rate and contractility. But the heart has an autorhythmic quality. It can generate its own electrical impulse. So depolarization is the creation of an electrical impulse and repolarization is electrical resetting in its simplest form. In health, depolarization starts in the top right of the heart that's the patient's right. You can see that on the diagram there, in the sinoatrial or SA node. And that's the pacemaker of the heart because it depolarizes the most frequently. See the arrows spreading out from the SA node? That's because the electrical impulse spreads through both atria preceding their contraction. The electrical impulse then squeezes through the atrioventricular or AV node and in health this is the only connection electrically between atria and ventricles. Depolarization then travels down the left and right bundle branches and through the smaller Purkinje fibres and this precedes ventricular contraction. OK, let's relate that now to one ECG complex. What you're seeing on the screen now is one heartbeat represented on paper, electrically. It's one ECG complex. Let's go through it. The flat line at either end of the complex is the isoelectric line, where electrically nothing is happening. Then you see, moving from the left, the P wave. This represents both atria being depolarized together. Two atria give one P wave. Then you have a flat line. 
This is where the electrical impulse is squeezing through that narrow band of tissue in the middle of the heart, the atrioventricular or AV node, so it takes a little bit of time. We know that as the PR interval. In reality, we measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the end of that flat line, and this will become more relevant as we review our 12 lead ECGs. Then you see the big QRS complex. Just run it together, QRS complex. And that represents depolarization of the larger ventricles. Then there is a pause, the ST segment. And then there is electrical resetting or repolarization of the ventricles, represented by the T wave. Of course, there is repolarization of the atria, but that occurs underneath the QRS complex. And that is one heartbeat represented electrically. So this complex represents sinus rhythm, which we hope to see in our patients. But the question is, if the patient is in sinus rhythm, how do the leads differ on the 12 lead ECG? Well, it's about the relationship between the general direction of depolarization through the heart and from where the 12 different leads view this. Do remember that when we refer to leads, this can mean two things the electrodes we attach to the patient, but also the points from which the ECG is looking at the heart. And that's what we're referring to here. We're talking about interpretation, not recording a 12 lead ECG. This general direction of depolarization is known as the cardiac axis. And it spreads from the patient's top right, the sinus node, through the atrioventricular or AV node and down to the left ventricle as this has a larger muscle mass than the right ventricle and extra wiring for want of a better phrase. Of course depolarization spreads all around the heart but the general direction follows that pathway. In addition, as depolarization heads towards the lead it causes an upward deflection from baseline which we can see on the 12 lead and as it heads away from a lead it causes a downward deflection. We see this best in the QRS complex, which will be positive with a tall R wave and a shorter S wave as depolarization heads towards that lead, and a short R wave and a deeper S wave as depolarization heads away from that lead, positive and negative. Now to see how this manifests on the 12 lead ECG, we can look at the limb leads and then we can look at the chest leads. Here's the normal 12 lead ECG or EKG again and you'll see to the left you have a variety of leads. These are the limb leads 1, 2, 3 and VR, VL and VF commonly with the letter A before them. To the right are the chest leads progressing from V1 to V6 sometimes C1 to C6 obviously standing for chest. You know when you place the limb leads on the patient that you place four of them, on the wrists or the arms and the legs. But in reality, the 12 lead ECG gives you six limb leads. What you're looking at here is what we call an adapted form of the hexaxial reference system. And by explaining this to you, you'll realize why the leads differ slightly, even though they're all in sinus rhythm. What you're looking at is just the limb leads here, not the chest leads. You can see in the middle is a line drawing of the heart and around it are all of the limb leads. Those lines that come from those limb leads represent which areas of the heart that they look at. So for example, AVR looks over the right atrium and VL or AVL over the left atrium. The different shapes we see in the limb leads are due to this relationship between the cardiac axis and where the leads look at the general pathway of depolarization. AVR is very negative. Look at the small R wave and deep S wave and the P and T waves are upside down or inverted as the cardiac axis is heading away from that lead from 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock if you imagine the heart is like a clock face. Lead 2 is very upright as depolarization is heading towards it, while AVL, or VL here, has an R wave as tall as the S wave is deep, as depolarization passes at right angles, neither towards it nor away from it. Leads 1, AVF and 2 are still quite upright as they sense depolarization heading towards them. Now sometimes lead 2 isn't the tallest, it may be a lead nearby. 
It is normal for the cardiac access to swing a little to the right or left between people. But significant left or right access deviation is something we're not looking at in this workshop, but you may like to look that up for yourself. Now understanding this diagram is very important because I'm going to show you here the normal 12 lead ECG and you can't really work out where those limb leads are looking unless you have that picture, here it is again, in your mind. So it's very helpful when you're out in clinical practice to be able to draw this quite quickly, perhaps on the back of the ECG, if your memory has failed you or you're still learning which area of the heart the limb leads look at. So why don't we just draw that very quickly? I'm drawing a Y shape, simple as that, labelling it AVR, AVL and AVF. You can simply do this on the back of your 12 lead. Add in your three remaining limb leads, one, two and three, and then draw an outline of a heart shape, like that. And that immediately tells you which areas of the heart those leads are looking at. You can see that leads 3, AVF and 2 look at the inferior or low down part of the heart. Lead 1, the lateral left ventricle, AVR and AVL, the right and left atrium respectively. Then draw in an arrow. That's your cardiac access, 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And then you can work out how positive or upright or negative or downwards, the QRS complex is in the various leads because of their relationship to that arrow as it comes towards the lead or away from it. Progressing on, let's look at the chest leads. And these are slightly easier to understand. Uh, if you look at this diagram, this is where the leads are placed. And although I said I wouldn't look at uh, where we stick leads, uh, this helps you to understand that the chest leads look at the heart from a horizontal plane. Here we are with the 12 lead ECG and you're looking at the right hand side V1 through to V6, sometimes known as C1 to C6 for chest. You'll notice that the QRS complex progresses from being very negative in V1 with a short upright R wave and a deep S wave to being very positive in V5, V6 with a tall R wave and hardly any or none at all S wave. Now, normally V5 is the tallest, although here V4 seems to be competing for that, but normally, and that doesn't matter, that's fine, but normally you see V5 as the tallest. So if we go back to this diagram, I'll explain why. Again, it's the general direction of depolarization through the heart, that is the cardiac axis, and V1 senses most of that depolarization heading away from it and gives you a very downward or negative QRS complex and V5 and V6 sense most of the depolarization heading towards them and gives you a very upright R wave and hardly any S wave, sometimes none at all. So the chest leads progress from negative to positive from V1 or C1 to V6 or C6. Before we progress any further, it's important that I take you through the calibration on the 12 lead ECG or EKG. Internationally, paper comes out of the machine or complexes pass by on a monitor at a set speed of 25 millimetres per second. You've probably realised that the graph paper represents time on the tracing, and depolarization takes time to pass through the various areas of the heart. You need to analyse these timings, and you can't if the speed calibration is wrong. In addition is the standardised box calibration to the left, what we could call the height calibration. One millivolt of sensed electrical activity is standardised to two large squares high, so you must see this correct box calibration on the left of the tracing. So do check these before you start reading the 12 lead ECG or EKG. Let's look now at three important timings on the 12 lead ECG. There are many others, but I think the important ones, certainly for basic interpretation, are the heart rate, of course, the PR interval, and the QRS complex. If you want to know the heart rate, we'll take the patient's pulse, of course, and usually the heart rate is also printed on your 12 lead. But if you don't have this information, you can work it out from the complexes. You need to count the number of large squares between the same two points on two adjacent complexes, and normally we count the number of large squares between two R waves, the R to R interval. 
If the heart rate is very high, you won't get many large squares between the R waves. So if there is one large square between an R wave and the next R wave, we divide that into 300. 300 divided by 1 is 300, so the heart rate is very high at 300. If there are two large squares, the heart rate is 150. Three large squares, 100. Four large squares, 75. Five large squares, 60, and so on. Divide the number of large squares into 300. Don't worry if it isn't in whole numbers. For example, if you have one and a half large squares or 2.2 large squares, whatever, just divide that figure into 300. So it might be 3.2 or 4.8. Whatever it is, divide it into 300. Now, this is fine when the heart rate is regular. But when it's irregular, and this normally corresponds to atrial fibrillation, the heart rate accelerates and slows down over the period of a minute. So counting the number of large squares really doesn't give a good representation of what the heart rate is. So there are various ways of calculating the heart rate in atrial fibrillation or other irregular arrhythmias. And what we tend to do, or what I do, is I count out 30 large squares. This equals 6 seconds. I count the number of R waves in that 30 large square period and I times by 10. It's not brilliant, but it picks up much more of the pattern of irregularity. I have to be honest, I would strongly recommend you take the pulse of the patient for a full minute. If anything, when you take a pulse, you get more information from the patient, such as the strength and character of the pulse. So if you need to find out whether the heart rate is regular, just place a piece of paper over the 12 lead ECG and mark off two R waves. When you move the piece of paper along and lay the first mark over an R wave, the second mark should correspond to the next R wave. It's regular. If it doesn't, there is a suspicion that it could be atrial fibrillation. Be aware it could be other things such as sinus arrhythmia, which is where the heart rate, usually in younger patients, slightly accelerates and decelerates with breathing in and out. OK, other measurements. The PR interval. We measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the end of the flat line that follows it. The PR interval should be three to five small squares long, no longer, or three small squares to one large square because there are five small squares in one large square. If the PR interval is consistently longer, this could possibly be first degree heart block. And the PR interval equates to problems with the atrioventricular node. And if it is first degree heart block, it means that the AV node or the atrioventricular node is holding up that impulse a little longer than it should do. Usually it's nothing serious and the patient will not normally be hemodynamically compromised. The other measurement we need to look at is the QRS complex, and in addition to this, we need to look at the shape of the QRS complex. At its widest point, the QRS complex should be no wider than three small squares. It can be on three small squares, but it shouldn't be any wider. For those who like numbers, and I prefer squares, particularly in the speed of clinical practice, three small squares equals 0.12 of a second. Five small squares, which is the same as one large square, equals 0.2 of a second, and five large squares equals a second. As you can see, it can get rather complex, which is why I like working with squares rather than numbers. Look also at the shape of the QRS complex. They should all be nice and sharp and narrow, not a bizarre shape. So the shape is also important. I must be honest with you, it doesn't really matter how narrow the QRS complex is. And it can be narrow as a pin, narrow as a hair, particularly when heart rates are very high and everything gets squashed up on a 12 lead ECG. It's when it's wide and when it's bizarre in shape that we have concerns. So remember, check your heart rate, look at your PR interval, and look at the shape and the width of the QRS complex. And we'll look at all of that when we start reviewing our 12 lead ECG. That concludes session one, so very well done for sticking with it. You may want to replay this just until you've got all the principles that I'm talking about, and I'll join you in session two.